Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Others by James Herbert. Dane reads the number one chiller writer. So as always, I'm going to go through and check out my blurb, then I'm going to go through and check my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, my redemption began in hell. So begins James Herbert's controversial and stunning new chiller. Nicholas Dismas is a private investigator, but like no other that has gone before him, he carries a secret about himself to which not even he has the answer. He is hired to find a missing baby, one that was taken away at birth, or was it? His investigation takes him to a mysteriously located place called Perfect Rest. It is supposed to be a nursing home for the elderly, but is it? Here Dismas will discover the dark secret of the others, and in an astonishing and spectacular finale he will resolve the enigma of his own existence. As chilling, as memorable and as timely as only James Herbert can be, others will join the classics for which he is remembered with fear. So let's check out some tabs. We start off with chapter one, uh, which takes place in hell, and it's kind of the foreshadowing. I've got to be honest, I don't think this element of the storyline was really needed, but hey ho. Um, here we get this little conversation. You are blessed with so many gifts for your test time on earth, yet you squandered them all. Use them for your own self-gratification. Yes, I know, I know. I agreed with a barely repressed sniffle. You were guilty of hedonism. Yes. Sensualism. Yes. Eudaemonism. Uh, she doesn't know what it means. And so here we learn um, a little bit about his investigations agency that he runs and the difference between a private detective and a private investigator. So, I'm Nick, Nicholas Dismas, and I run the Dismas Investigations Agency. A two-room office with leaning walls and crooked door frames, a couple of floors above a charity shop, a few doors along from Brighton's Theatre Royale. In the heart of the seaside town, we're close to the train station, shops, seafront, and more importantly, a crush of solicitors' offices from which we get most of our business. No, it's an investigations agency, not a detective agency. We don't detect anything. That's for the big boys who have more contacts, generally richer clients, in particular companies and financial institutions, and who earn a whole lot more from a higher scale of fees than we humble investigators. Also, unlike us, they quite often get involved in criminal cases. The one thing we do have in common, though, is that neither party has any real power or authority. We're ordinary citizens with no official status whatsoever. The private investigator's job generally involves process serving, handling writs and summonses and the like, tracing, tracking down certain people who had decided to go missing, usually because of financial or domestic difficulties, status and credit reports, accident and insurance inquiries, repossessions, debt collecting, surveillance, which includes anything from watching individuals or premises, to joining a company as an employee in order to catch out pilferers or industrial spies, to following errant husbands or wives. Mostly mundane, even boring work that requires patience, care and an eye for detail. A sense of humour sometimes helps too. And so then we get this, somebody dies and we get this, um... You can't stop there, Etta. What'll it take to bribe you? She sighed. You won't let it go anyway, will you? I shook my head. You know you want to tell me. She smiled, revealing small, even teeth. Yes, I do, you bastard. She took a nip of brandy, grimaced, and chased the taste away with coffee. Okay, you've heard of couples becoming locked together during intercourse. My turn to grin again. I've witnessed dogs in that awkward state, but I always thought it was a myth as far as we humans were concerned. No, it isn't actually. It's not common, but it happens. Ask any experienced doctor. Sometimes a woman might panic for some reason or other while copulating and then becomes incapable of relaxing her legs, which become locked tight. Basically, a guy had a heart attack and died during sex. And then uh, Nick thinks this, which is kind of how I think as well. I berate myself for believing there was a God to give any such rhyme or reason. Nothing, no thing, no heavenly creature, no ruler of heaven and earth, no divine deity, no almighty, no omnipresence, no Allah, Elohim, Yahweh or Jehovah would ever devise such a hellish torture. Maybe a devil could, but surely no God. And we get this line, which is just a nod to a great song. It had to be you, she said quietly. Nice song, I replied sourly, still wondering what happened to the coke euphoria. I could sing a few bars if you'd like. And then we learn where uh, the guy gets his name Dis Dismas from. So, uh, I learned about the name years later when I went back to the convent when I was trying to trace my origins, trying to find out if they had any idea of who left me there in the cold. And one of them told me about my name, first about the caretaker Nick, then why they'd chosen Dismas as a surname. She told me quite eagerly, as though the knowledge somehow would help me in my future life. She said Dismas was one of the two criminals crucified alongside Christ, the good thief, the one who repented before he died and was promised paradise because of it. I was so ugly, you see. Those nuns thought I was being punished for some terrible thing I would do later in life. You get that? Not for some past sin in another life, because nuns don't believe in reincarnation, but for some crime yet to be committed. So they prayed for my soul every day I was with them, and long after I'd left, 
Not for me, the person, the poor thing they'd found among their garbage, but for my invisible soul. They hoped I'd repent before I even sinned, and Dismas was their way of wishing me luck. And this is how I dream as well. And so he says, For the second night I fell into a dreamless sleep, which was not only unusual given the events of that evening, but extraordinary, because I'd always suffered, and I mean suffered, from full technical or Dolby sound sensorama dreams and nightmares since I could remember. One of the reasons I don't sleep well, because I'm scared to go to sleep. And um, there's a lot of like... Uh, a lot of different, um, what would you call it, like imagery and stuff that she used, and one of them is like this recurring image of a bird, and it's actually a clue because one of the characters we bump into later, later is called Hildegard Vogel, and Vogel means bird in German, so her nickname was the Sparrow. We get a reference that dates it to only when Concord flew over did the noise become an intrusion, one that lasted minutes after the hook-nosed jet was out of sight. So I don't know when this was published, let's have a look, because there are mobile phones in it in Concord, yeah, 1999. So it's quite a specific period of time when mobile phones are a thing, and so was Concord, because Concord has since been dis uh, discontinued. And he's got a colleague, and I love this. Uh, the VAT returns were due soon, and Henry always got into a tiz about that. Some women suffered from premenstrual tension. Henry suffered from pre-VAT tension. VAT, the accountant's PMT. We get a reference to the Elephant Man, which was interesting, because I started reading this on my way into London to go meet someone. And we went on a Jack the Ripper tour, and they mentioned during that that the Elephant Man was one of the people suspected of being Jack the Ripper, although it probably wasn't him. And here I just want to read this out because this shows um, some of Herbert's like gross out writing. He's really good at that. Um, he's describing one of the people they find, um, these people born with birth defects. There was no skin on her back, in fact no flesh at all. Neither was there much flesh behind her legs. It was as if the meat there had been cut away, leaving bones and muscle, gristle and tendons, organs and tubes, arteries and veins, all open to the fetid air, all displayed before my probing torch. I saw wires and dulled metal plates holding organs in place, tying blood vessels to a spinal column, gauze covering the most delicate areas. I saw tubing that was synthetic and of different colours, presumably there to aid bodily fluids and movement, replacements for parts that must have rotted or become dysfunctional. The cavities glistened with wetness, and jutting just beneath the bands of muscle stretched over the bone of her shoulder blade, I could see something throbbing in a regular rhythm. I realised it was part of her naked heart. And we get this to is describing the beast, and I'm going to read this out. It. I could not refer to it as he, for this thing was part animal, part man, neither species, it seemed to me, dominating the other was now under restraint, the male orderly I knew as Bruce holding one of its arms, another thick-set orderly clinging to the other. Its reddish mottled skin was mostly covered by short, wiry hair, and its shoulders were massive against its slim waist and legs, even its forearms thinning beyond the elbow to the wrists, its hands long, slender fingers ending in curled nails like claws. And then I saw the most frightening thing of all about this mad-eyed creature, for events had happened too fast, my sight too restricted, when I had been attacked. Springing from the creature's naked loin, like some lengthy arabescent rod, whose colour paled and surged, was a penis of the like I had never before witnessed. Although it was slender considering its stretch, a foot and a half at least, it was gorged with blood that set it rigid and quivering, the flow inside accounting for its fluctuating hues, and at its end was a split bulbous head that glistened wetly under the harsh lights. Rather than a natural organ of procreation, this looked lethal, more like a weapon of destruction. I shuddered at the thought of the damage it could do if it entered someone as small and frail as Constant. And this was quite interesting too, I'll just read it out. I'd nurtured the second long cigarette Wizbeach had given me, drawing on it and the one before occasionally to keep it alive. It had burnt down close to the filter by now, but was still usable as a weapon and certainly the only one I had close at hand, literally. Many years ago I'd been taught the basic techniques of fending off an aggressor with the use of everyday objects such as a rolled magazine, a small stick, a spoon, a pencil, even a matchbox. You had a two to one chance of knocking someone out with a fist clenched matchbox. My teacher, a nightclub bouncer who had spent some time with the SAS before one public brawl too many had brought about an abrupt end to his military career. He had shown me how a glowing cigarette could be lethal if applied correctly to the right area of a body. I don't know if it can necessarily be lethal, but it can definitely be very painful. We get this, and I love this because I always spot the ejaculations. It yowled. Christ, then the beast screeched, an ejaculation of sound so fierce and piercing it stung my heart, and I screeched too. After all, I knew the feeling. Uh, we get a reference to uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Casey. Great book. We read it earlier this year, actually. And I just love this as well. This is the kind of thing that I'd do. And then, aloud, my own defiant war cry, Fuck it! At least I'd give Constance and Michael a chance. I expected to die right then and there, but curiously, I no longer cared. Life itself was taking the piss, and I'd had enough. I rushed to meet the foe. 
So yeah, all in all, Others by James Herbert. I've read maybe six or seven of Herbert's novels now, and this is my third favourite behind The Rats and The Fog. I would give this a four out of five and would recommend it. Don't be intimidated by its size. I read it in like two or three days. Uh, and definitely thrilling, and it does definitely have this like triumphant denouement at the end as well that it kind of talks about in the book's blurb. Uh, everything kind of really builds to a head. But it's one of those where there's a lot of stuff happening from start to finish, really. It was very plot-driven, this one, which I enjoyed. So there we have it. That's what I made of Others. The Others, Others by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.